proudly distributed over everybody. Now, I, the, <laughs> one person got five, one person got four, and everybody else was just, just single votes, uh, and that could have been themselves. Um, <laughs> now, that's, that's kind of tough to make, a, make an award. Could I ask you to think about this, maybe go around? Yeah, there's no hurry, <laughs> except you got to do it <laughs> today. Uh, could I just ask you to go back around and think about it and then make another vote? Really make another vote? Okay, thanks. We'll, we'll see if we can converge on something. I just need a little bit more than I need. A, if I had 10% of the total on at least one person, I'd be happy. Okay, well, at any rate, think about it, go around, and then make another, make another vote. And we'll, we'll do that after the coffee break. After, actually, we'll do it after lunch, give you a chance to do that. Okay, so we're going to get going. Um, got Alessandro Ferraro here. Uh, there's a slight change. We may actually go down into the Adriatico guest house to the Info Lab because the, the tutorials are going to be down there with Python. I think everybody now is an expert, <laughs> thanks to Mikhail. <laughs> and uh, so we may... Uh, we were going down at, at uh, 3.30, maybe uh, I'm going to check, but probably we'll go down at uh, just after lunch. But let, let me confirm that. I just want to make sure it's ready down there. Okay, so I'll just uh, hand it over to Alessandro. We've got a, got a couple of guests back there. We've got Anthony Johnson and Vang Gu. <laughs> hey, why don't you guys stand up and wave? <laughs> <laughs> Anthony doesn't want to stand up. He's been traveling too long. At any rate, they're from OSA, and uh, and uh, and you'll see see more people, kind of strange people wandering in. Okay, <laughs> all right. So, Alessandro, let's go. Thank you. So, I don't know if yes, I think this works. Perfect. Uh, so, well, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for being here. <laughs> This set of lectures is uh, uh, probably going to be a bit different with respect to uh, what you have done uh, the last week, let's say. Uh, we will not see so much physics, let's say, or not so much photonics, at least this morning. Uh, can you hear me well? Is it, is it fine up there? Is it going like this? Is it better? Okay, I'll try to shout then. Uh, okay. Uh, I was saying that uh, probably uh, we're not going to see so much uh, so much physics this morning. Uh, um, a bit more uh, in the afternoon during the tutorial, uh, which will be based on uh, some examples uh, uh, taken from uh, photonics. But uh, yeah, you, you have to cope with that for, for, for this morning. Uh, the topic is machine learning, essentially, uh, with some applications uh, to, to computer science. Is, sorry, to computer science, to, to quantum technologies. But I'm not a computer scientist, so by formation I'm a, a theoretical physicist uh, working on mainly quantum information, quantum optics, especially quantum information with continuous variables. But I'm not going to talk about that today. Uh, so before starting, just to have an idea uh, of your background, um, I'd like to ask a couple of questions. So please raise your hands uh, uh, ju just to me to, to gauge a bit uh, uh, the speed, uh, the pace of, uh, uh, of my lecture. And also to decide a bit better what to do in the afternoon if. Uh, really skip the last uh, hour and bring the tutorial forward or uh, keep the, uh, the program as it is. Uh, so um, neural networks, uh, let's say how many of, of you have trained a neural network? Okay, two, three, four, okay. So, I'm assuming that this is going to be a very introductory course on machine learning and, and neural networks. And uh, I, I'm sorry for the four of you, uh, because in that case, probably uh, you will take very little bit uh, out, of, uh, out of this. 
But uh, have you trained other, uh, let's say, mm, machine learning uh, algorithms, anything? No, one. Uh, principal component analysis? Okay. Other four for principal component analysis and four for neural networks. Okay, so difficult, but I was expecting something like this, more or less. Okay. Uh, ah, by the way, uh, in the morning, uh, I will be uh, the one giving these lectures. Uh, uh, then for the tutorials, uh, mainly uh, Luca Innocente will be, will be in charge of that. Okay? Uh, we're both uh, based uh, in Belfast. Um, and uh, uh, you can see in one of the few sunny days uh, in Belfast in this picture. And that is all I have to say about it now. So this is the, uh, more or less the outline of these lectures. I divided them in two parts. There is a bonus part that uh, concerns quantum uh, uh, information technologies only, but given, uh, uh, given my very short survey, probably I'm going to skip that third part. So I'm going to deliver only these this two. So uh, you can see that uh, um, in the first part, I will give you an overview, essentially, uh, of various methods uh, in machine learning. There are three uh, big categories uh, in which machine learning methods are, are divided. Uh, and we will see a bit of uh, the three of them with applications, uh, some applications to uh, quantum information technologies. Okay? Uh, and in the second part, uh, we will focus more on the first of the three, so supervised uh, uh, learning, but more than that in particular really to uh, what an artificial neural network is uh, and uh, how um, it can be trained. Okay? Uh, probably this is the most important slide uh, that I have here, uh, and it's essentially for you um, if you want to learn by yourself uh, some of these things. Um, okay, if you are taking pictures, it's fine. Uh, otherwise, uh, I can I can just put it in uh, uh, online. Um, so. There are, of course, a plethora of uh, resources available online about, uh, about machine learning in general. I'm suggesting, uh, let's say, uh, given the audience uh, uh, with a background on quantum optics and quantum information, uh, I'm suggesting a book by the same author of quantum information and computation, so Michael Nielsen. Uh, he left, let's say, quantum information several years ago. But some time ago, he became interested in machine learning, and of course, he wrote the book. Okay? Uh, and this book is available for free on the web. It's actually, uh, I don't even know how to call it. Uh, it's an e-book, maybe. Uh, it's, um, it's available only on the web, uh, And uh, it's very well done, because uh, it also has uh, some uh, pieces of code um, that uh, can, be, uh, can be used uh, and on which uh, the examples of, of the book are, are, are based on. Uh, then, uh, if you want, there is, uh, uh, as, another, um, as another possible source, uh, there is this uh, Aurel Geron book, uh, which is very basic, but it's really hands-on. Uh, it's based on Python. Of course, we are not talking anymore about uh, uh, theoretical physics by formation, I think. This is really computer science. Uh, and it's uh, mainly based on Python. So scikit-learn is essentially the workhorse library for data analysis uh, nowadays. And, uh, uh, and this book is based, uh, is based on that. Uh, otherwise, at a more, uh, much more general level, uh, there is a classic book by Russell and Norvig on, on artificial intelligence. Um, but there are also other types of resources, uh, uh, um, very useful. Uh, in particular, there are um, various freely available video lectures uh, around. Uh, the first set of lectures that I suggest is by Florian Marcard, 
so theoretical quantum physicist uh, uh, working on quantum optics, quantum information, automechanics, uh, many body theory, etc. Uh, so he started being interested in this topic some time ago, uh, and now there are uh, a dozen of uh, the lectures that he gives at his own university, uh, and uh, the, they are freely available. Uh, otherwise, these other three sets of lectures uh, are from uh, uh, computer scientists, data, anal data, data analysts, and you can find them, uh, well, either in some repositories as this uh, summer school of uh, uh, deep learning and reinforcement learning uh, uh, held a couple of years ago in Toronto, or uh, even uh, just on YouTube. Okay. Uh, but there are, as I said, many, many resources available online nowadays. Uh, regarding, on the other hand, uh, uh, aspects uh, uh, more close to, uh, specifically to physics uh, and to quantum information, uh, there have been already a set of uh, um, reviews that are available. Uh, I've listed here the first authors of all of them. You can find them on the archive. Uh, and uh, they focused on different aspects, let's say, but... Uh, you can, you can gauge that from, uh, essentially, from their title. It's easy to, to see. Um, OK, so I will start with the actual, uh, with the actual lecture. Uh, are there questions at the moment about the logistics of it or anything? I think I will take a break uh, at some point before, uh, before 11, maybe 45 minutes or something like that, uh, just because two hours uh, is... Uh, 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 it's too long, uh, so I'm telling you, uh, so if at some point you want to have a break, I will also want to have a break, so don't worry. So let's start with the first uh, of this, uh, um, mm, on these various techniques that I was mentioning. So there are, uh, let's say, these machine learning techniques uh, are mostly used to perform data analysis. So uh, data came in various sorts of ways. Uh, and uh, we will start with uh, what is called uh, uh, supervised learning. In which uh, the data come uh, in the form of uh, uh, a set of uh, vectors uh, and associated to that there is a label okay uh, the data uh, I'll denote it with X label with Y and I have many of them let's say N of them uh, can you read from there or I have, okay, perfect. Uh, so in this, uh, 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 you have to, th you can think of this as, for example, one of the most popular form of data are images, okay? So you might think of uh, uh, black and white images, for example, uh, with various uh, pixels. So one image I, can be uh, composed of various pixels. We can imagine that so to be uh, a real number, and we have, uh, let's say, p pixels around. Uh, and then to each image, you can associate a label. So for example, you can have uh, uh, various images of cats and various images of dogs. Okay? And you want to uh, give them then a new uh, image uh, you want your algorithm to be able to distinguish whether it's a cat or a dog. Okay? That's a classical example. Uh, if uh, your label is a discrete label, so let's say it belongs to ZP, like for cat or dog, uh, sorry, that P, Z, uh, T, whatever T is, uh, then we are calling about, we are talking about classification. 
if on the other hand is a continuous index, uh, we're talking about regression. But uh, so, so of course the, the tools used are slightly different with, with respect to what you want to do, but uh, what we're going to say uh, is common to, to, both, uh, to both cases. So the goal here, as I said, was to find a label for new data. So in fact, you want to find a function that goes from your set of data, so your set of uh, uh, numbers that might represent the pixel in your image, to the corresponding label. Okay? So you want to guess uh, this function, uh, in fact. Uh, so let's call this function f. And the point is that we will have uh, uh, that uh, uh, we want to use this function not over the uh, data that we have been given, but on new data. So we want to evaluate my function that will be the output essentially of my algorithm uh, on uh, some uh, new data and associate to it uh, possibly a correct, a correct label. Yeah. So of course we have to uh, understand, uh, uh, we have to do things in such a way that this label, uh, uh, this new label associated to the new data is accurate. So we need a sort of metric uh, to um, decide which uh, function is going to be the right one. So uh, how do we do that? How do we associate a, a, a correct function? Well, by uh, essentially defining a distance, a notion of distance uh, between the output of the function that is going to fit my data and uh, uh, the, uh, the actual label associated to it. So this, uh, uh, this distance is uh, a sort of uh, cost function that we want to, to minimize. Okay. And the way it works is that this, this function here is going to be parameterized. Okay. So uh, we want to uh, to find the best in a way that I'm going to explain uh, in a second set of parameters for my function f. And these parameters I'm going to denote them the, col the full collection of, this, of these parameters with W, okay? And uh, these W, uh, I will call them uh, in general weights. Uh, so this is essentially fitting, okay? fitting a function, F -f fitting uh, an unknown function with, uh, uh, with a parameterized function. Uh, these weights, uh, in general, are going to be real and of a certain, uh, of a certain dimension. Let me denote uh, the, the distance as uh, a distance function between the output of the function that I want to optimize and uh, the corresponding correct label. Okay. Of course, I want this to be as small as possible. Okay. So I want to uh, minimize this distance. Uh, for the moment, 
I'm not going to specify better which type of distance we're going to use, okay? We're going to see that in the, in the second part of this talk, but typically are quadratic functions or uh, entropic, uh, uh, entropic type of functions. Uh, and uh, uh, something that um, we're, going to, uh, we're going to need here is a concept of uh, average distance yeah, with respect to the full set of uh, data that, that we are given. Okay? Uh, so as I told you, the data are given in this form. And uh, uh, the data that we assume are given are called training data. Uh, and we want this distance uh, to be as small as possible over all the possible training data. So the actual cost function that uh, uh, we're going to minimize uh, is not the cost function over a single data, but over all of them. Okay. So my cost function is actually going to be the average of D over all training data. Uh, and uh, this we can call it cost function C, depending, that depends on my, uh, on the set of my uh, weights, okay? The set of my parameters. Uh, so which is simply, of course, the sum uh, over all this uh, uh, distance function uh, over all the training data divided by the number of training data. So the idea, as I was saying, is find uh, the best set of parameters, which means that uh, we want to uh, find the set of parameters omega such that my cost function is minimized. Uh, and up to here, let's say, is really just uh, uh, um, a way to formalize uh, um, a fitting procedure. However, the main goal, as I was saying, is that this function works on new data. Uh, so, there is another concept here of cost beyond this, uh, this cost function. That is that we also want to minimize uh, the errors uh, that my function can, uh, uh, can have over a set of new data. Okay? And how is that done typically? Well, what is typically done is that in fact, uh, the whole uh, data data that, that, that you have, you usually divide them in two groups, okay? or at least two groups. Uh, one is this training set of data over you actually try to minimize this cost function. Okay? And another one, uh, which we can, another set that we call the uh, test set, are used in order to minimize the possible error that the function can have when it is used uh, on new data. So what is called the general generalization error here. Okay. So uh, let's say another notion of error that is here tested is the generalization error. So 
So the error that uh, I will have when I use my uh, newly defined uh, function over another set of test data that are, again, going to be given in the same form as before, okay? Just another sample of them. Uh, so f for that, uh, I have divided, therefore, my original data uh, in uh, what is called a training set and the test set. Uh, so let's, uh, uh, let's say a couple of things about this. Uh, so first of all, you can imagine uh, that w when we're talking about images, uh, we're talking about really uh, pretty, pretty huge uh, vectors. Okay? Uh, and uh, in fact, this set of parameters uh, uh, here can assume, can be of a very large number and talking about millions and millions of parameters. Okay? So these are uh, not function that depends on just a few parameters, but really millions of them. Okay? Uh, at times also billions of, uh, of parameters. Okay? Uh, but these things in fact can work pretty well, as you probably know also mm, because of general knowledge. Uh, and uh, uh, so this is an example of, uh, uh, a quite famous example of uh, how well it, uh, this, uh, uh, these methods can work. Mm, so I'm not going to uh, say anything specifically now about how these uh, have been trained. But the idea is that, for example, uh, uh, images are given uh, with uh, their own uh, labels. So the label here, for example, is a mite, is a container ship, it's a motor scooter, it's a leopard. Uh, and these are, uh, let's say, um, this example is taken from a training set with a thousand, I think, of labels, something like that, for this type of images. And uh, uh, the outcome here that is given uh, is for this row, for the first four images, uh, the ones that have been uh, uh, better classified, uh, and the last four are the ones that are worst uh, classified. Uh, and uh, these, um, these histograms are proportional uh, to the probability given by the algorithm to each of the label. Okay? So uh, you can see that uh, um, in this case, for example, the probability to, uh, uh, to associate a label, uh, uh, a correct label, is very high, but also the, the wrong labels are not so wrong. Uh, and uh, uh, here we have, on the other hand, wrongly classified images, but even if they are wrongly classified, because you see that, uh, let's say, the maximum probability is given to a convertible and not a grill, and I honestly don't even know the difference between a convertible and a grill, uh, but the second one is a grill. Okay? So it's, uh, uh, it pretty works like, uh, pretty much works like we were expecting. And for example, here uh, in these other images, uh, in, in this other image, uh, we have that uh, the algorithm was finding a dog, uh, whereas uh, in principle the label was a cherry. But this is very arbitrary. Okay? So this uh, uh, this type of uh, uh, algorithms works can, can work extremely well. Okay? And uh, when we say that uh, uh, we train these uh, these algorithms. Uh, we say that we mean that uh, we try to uh, find this uh, set of, uh, of parameters that performs this, mi this minimization uh, and uh, uh, in such a way that we uh, can then evaluate the performances using, uh, uh, let's say, various figures of merit. But essentially, it depends on whether we are uh, using uh, our, uh, uh, our algorithm to do classification, 
like as in this case, or to do, or to do regression. Okay? So when we do classification, the accuracy uh, over the, the test set is the figure of merit that we use to uh, quantify whether uh, our uh, uh, training, so our uh, fine tuning of the parameters, uh, how well it has worked. Yeah? So uh, let's say if my labels uh, are, uh, uh, are discrete, then use the accuracy. So uh, the accuracy is the fraction of correct labels for the test set. So you divide uh, your original data in, uh, in two categories, in, in, two, in two sets. You use the training set to train uh, uh, your, uh, uh, your algorithm, in particular your neural network. Uh, once that is trained, then you test it on, uh, on the test set of data. Okay? Uh, and uh, uh, the fraction of uh, correctly labeled data uh, is uh, what denotes the accuracy. And uh, uh, extremely high level of accuracies can be, can be reached uh, with, this type, uh, with this type of tasks. Okay? Uh, and we will see some specific example uh, uh, later on. Otherwise, uh, uh, let's say in the, most, uh, in, in, the, in the case of a continuum uh, uh, set, uh, then we use the, usually a mean square, a mean square error to, uh, again, for the test set, to evaluate uh, uh, the, qual the quality of the, of the training and the quality of the, uh, of the algorithm. Yeah. Uh, I'm now going to give uh, some examples uh, uh, not related to, uh, let's say, class uh, classical cases, but related to quantum ones. But are there questions uh, up until now? Of course, interrupt me whenever you want. How? Sorry? Which image uh, are you referring to? The, the, the last four, they're wrong because uh, uh, you can see that, uh, um, let's say for the, for the case of the, of the cherry and the Dalmatian, the grill, the grill is wrong because uh, uh, this, uh, uh, this column, so this car is called grill, okay? is not a convertible. Okay? Whatever the difference it is between a grill and a convertible, I have no idea. Okay? <laughs> uh, but Well, so here you see that I'm saying that is wrong because this probability uh, of uh, uh, that the, algo the, the probability the algorithm gives uh, to to the convertible label is higher than the probability that the algorithm gives for the grill label. Okay, so this is what I mean by it's wrong. Okay, because the algorithm associated an incorrect label. Okay. But now, I'm, I'm not sure that I'm getting your question. I cannot hear very well. Ah, OK. I know, I now I understand what the grill is. Good. <laughs> of course. Yes, 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 yes of course. Uh, but the, the point is that you have to imagine 
that uh, uh, a human person has first classified these, image, these images okay? and have associated a label to each of these images. Okay? Uh, and of course, the label associated to each of these images is subjective. Okay? So like for the case of the Dalmatian and the cherry, it's subjective whether to associate the label cherry of Dalmatian to that image. But the human person uh, that at the beginning associated the label to the original set of data thought, okay, this is a picture of a cherry, of cherries, okay? The uh, algorithm was trained with all this set of pictures. Some of them uh, with this ambiguity probably in the label. The algorithm is totally oblivious to, to this ambiguity. It learns what it learns. And then that is the output. Okay? Now, uh, the algorithm is trained on the part of the original data that are called training data. Then it is tested on the part of original data that are the test, the test set. Okay? If in the test set there happen to be that image of, of the Dalmatian or of the convertible uh, with a subjective label that we might not all agree, uh, well, but the label is that. Uh, has been already given originally from the very beginning. So that's why, uh, and, and, the, and the, the label given by the algorithm does not uh, uh, correspond to the label given originally by the human being that classified them. So it's flagged as an error. That's the point. We're not saying that the algorithm is wrong. Uh, the algorithm, let's say, that associates cherry to that image is wrong because uh, uh, of some higher reasons. No, it's wrong because it associates the label uh, cherry, whereas in my original set of data that I use, uh, some human being associated to that image, the, uh, the label uh, 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 Dalmatian, uh, it, wrong in this sense, okay? that it doesn't match the, uh, the label given originally by some human being. Yes? It's very hard to hear. Oh, okay. Mm. Uh, that's a very complex question. <laughs> okay. Uh, there are uh, various ways in which you can use uh, uh, the fact that you have a small amount of data and still obtain something meaningful, uh, I'm not going to touch them today, okay? Uh, they are quite advanced. Uh, but yes, the, there are. It's much more difficult. We're going to see an example of why that is difficult. Okay? Uh, for example, if you have few data, you may end up uh, uh, in a problem called overfitting in the sense that your function that you're going to train your, uh, uh, over your uh, um, set of, uh, uh, so the set of parameters that you're going to find are going to perfectly be able to, uh, to fit your very few data, uh, but then mm, it's a disaster when you try to generalize them okay? because you are perfectly fitting the very few data that you have. Okay? So the, there are various problems, but yeah. It can be done with, with scarce data. Uh, there is uh, uh, an algo a type of uh, uh, methods uh, called reinforcement learning that actually works uh, very well with, uh, in a setting that is slightly different from this. That is slightly different from this, uh, but for which you have 
scarce rewards. So it's like sort of having like scarce data. Okay? So reinforcement learning might be uh, more, more useful in that case. Okay, so maybe I should go on with, uh, with some examples. Uh, so some example in quantum uh, uh, technologies, let's say. I will start with something extremely, extremely easy, uh, and then I will give you uh, an example related to uh, uh, to some actual research. Uh, so the, the, the most simple unit that you can think of in quantum information theory is the, a single qubit. Okay? Uh, so your data can be an original set of data can be uh, a set of uh, uh, density matrices rho i corresponding to one qubit. And uh, uh, the corresponding label can be, for example, whether this qubit is uh, in a pure state or in a mixed state. Okay. So it's a classification uh, case here. And uh, uh, it's useful, it's very easy, of course, uh, uh, to, to solve this problem uh, once you have directly the density matrix of your qubit. No, you just calculate trace of rho square. If it's equal to one, uh, it's pure. Otherwise, it's mixed. So it's clearly a silly example. But it's an example that you can, uh, uh, you can immediately use to train your, uh, uh, your algorithms. Mm. And in addition, it gives me uh, a bit the, um, the chance uh, to present you uh, with an example in which uh, even how to give your, the data that you have to the algorithm uh, can be a non-trivial question to answer. Okay? Uh, because, okay, we can think at uh, a density matrix of one qubit as, okay, four, uh, four elements uh, of, my, uh, of my matrix, um, each complex. Uh, so if I'm totally blind, really blind, I can give eight real parameters okay, to, my, uh, uh, to my algorithm. Uh, otherwise, uh, uh, if I think a bit more, uh, I can give just the two real parameters on the diagonal uh, and uh, the two real parameters uh, for the off-diagonal, for one of the off-diagonal, because the other is the complex conjugate. Okay? Or uh, I can uh, put in normalization uh, in the game, so it's actually only three uh, real parameters. But even that, uh, even in that case, uh, the option might be, okay, Am I going to give uh, the information uh, to my, the initial information to my algorithm as, let's say, uh, the real parameter associated to the uh, first element of the first, uh, of the row, first row and the uh, and first column, and then, I don't know, row 33, three, and then the imaginary part of row 1, 2, and the real part of row 2, 1, something like this, with associated, so it's a, it's a four, element vector with associated label. Okay. Uh, so I'm essentially vectorizing uh, the matrix. Or maybe we can think uh, that it might be more useful uh, to present directly to the algorithm the original data in the form of the block vector. So I can, instead of giving uh, uh, a vectorized form of, of my density matrix, I can give the block vector. And in that case, also, of course, the criterion uh, is, uh, is immediate. So if the length of the block vector is equal to 1, then it's pure. Uh, otherwise, it's mixed. So again, it's a, it's a very easy example, but 
gives already an idea of uh, uh, an immediate problem that you might face if you want to apply uh, one of these uh, uh, algorithms to, to a real problem in, qu in quantum information. Okay? So the data, the data are not given uh, immediately, for example, in the form of pixels, uh, numbers associated to, pic to pixels of an image. Okay? Uh, and uh, in, uh, in some cases, this can make a, sl a slightly different, uh, uh, a, a bit of a difference. Okay? So this is an example uh, of what can happen if the size, uh, uh, by changing the size of your uh, training data. No? There are, uh, so the two, um, Mm, the two colors uh, correspond to uh, whether I uh, gave to my algorithm uh, uh, the initial data in the form of block vectors or in the form of a density matrix, ve vectorized density matrix. So you see that uh, if the training set of data is, uh, um, uh, is composed of very few, uh, very few data, and this in a sense uh, uh, is an example of, uh, of what you were asking before, no? Uh, it can be very problematic for the algorithm uh, to determine uh, with a high level, uh, high percentage of accuracy, whether this uh, uh, state is uh, pure or mixed, uh, if the data are given uh, in the form of a density matrix, a ve vectorized density matrix. If they are given in the form of a block vector, uh, for the algorithm it's much easier, okay? Uh, of course, we are talking of very small uh, sets of data here because at some point uh, when you have enough data, then uh, mm, the, the accuracy of the algorithm is essentially oblivious uh, to, to whether uh, you are giving, you are giving mm, to it the data in a form that is easily digestible or not. Okay? It's complex enough that it can work out the solution uh, on its own. Uh, and something that is very interesting uh, is that uh, when uh, the uh, algorithm misclassify uh, your data, so associate uh, uh, a label pure when uh, uh, the density matrix was actually mixed or vice versa, well, if you calculate the, uh, the purity of all these uh, um, uh, states and you look at where the incorrectly uh, uh, classified state lies uh, on, uh, on this axis, uh, you will see, of course, the purity is a trace of rho square. Okay? Uh, you see that the misclassified data, they lie uh, um, close to uh, purity one, okay? Despite the fact that we are not telling anything to our algorithm about uh, the geometry of a single qubit or anything like that. But the algorithm immediately, immediately finds uh, essentially that the hard uh, samples are mm, the ones at the border between uh, the mixed uh, and pure states. Okay. Uh, a, a second uh, more exciting example, let's say, uh, more exciting because uh, we are now dealing with two qubits, uh, is again a classification. Uh, for two qubit, instead of uh, asking the algorithm to recognize whether uh, the state is pure or mixed, we ask the algorithm to recognize whether it's uh, entangled or separable. Okay, so these are now my my two labels. Uh, uh, and you can have a bit of fun with that. Uh, now for two qubits, again, the problem is solvable, um, but it's not as trivial as that for a generic uh, two qubit state. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm going to present here the results for um, the case of uh, a Werner state that uh, 
uh, that is given by this uh, uh, by this expression here. So it's a mixture between uh, um, the maximally mixed state and one of the Bell uh, states. So this psi minus uh, is the state uh, one over square root of two zero one minus one zero. Um, and uh, uh, this is a class that has only one parameter, uh, this alpha. But then we can imagine of uh, uh, rotating my Werner state. So and we can rotate it uh, 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 with a unitary uh, that acts only on one qubit. And this will add to a Werner state uh, uh, that, uh, that has only one parameter. So we'll add uh, uh, um, other four parameters. So this is going to be five parameters. Uh, and uh, we can, on the other hand, rotate both qubits. So we will end up with uh, sorry, nine parameters here, other four parameters. Uh, so for the algorithms, it will, will be more and more difficult to, to uh, so it will have to work with a larger family in principle. But you can see, and these are the red dots, that again, if you train uh, a sufficiently large uh, set of uh, states for the algorithm, uh, it's almost the same. Okay? And uh, uh, we did something similar. You can try to do something similar with the uh, X states. So X states are uh, a mixture. Here there is a typo. It should be a Psi plus. Uh, uh, it's a mixture of uh, uh, all the four Bell states with uh, P1, uh, P2, P3, P4 are, are probabilities. Uh, the uh, degrees of freedom here uh, that before were 1, uh, 5, uh, and 9. Uh, now, originally, they are three because of uh, these uh, uh, three parameters, P1, P2, and P3, let's say. And then P4 is just uh, the complementary probability. Uh, or it can get larger and larger. And here is the last set, for example, in which, on the other hand, the, uh, the qubits are chosen randomly. Yeah. Uh, and you see that, apart from this last set, uh, uh, even by uh, training, this is not a very uh, well-trained algorithm. I'm not using uh, uh, millions of, uh, of data and, uh, uh, and a high level of uh, uh, and a, a particularly complex uh, uh, algorithm. By the way, it's neural networks. Okay? But we're going to see later on what it means. So these are, uh, uh, let's say, easy example of how uh, these algorithms can be used to solve uh, problems in, uh, in quantum information theory. As I said, these are silly uh, examples uh, because we know how to solve these problems uh, essentially almost with pen and paper, uh, but it's just to give you an idea. Okay. Questions? Okay, uh, so the last example uh, for uh, supervised learning is on the other hand uh, related to uh, a research problem. And this is about uh, quantum error correction. And sh should give you a bit more the idea of uh, uh, how powerful these, uh, these tools can be. Uh, so the problem studied here uh, is uh, the typical problem that we have to face when uh, uh, we want to uh, correct noisy, uh, we can correct, we want to correct errors uh, raising from a noisy environment. Uh, so let's say that in principle we have uh, for example, one uh, logical qubit uh, that we want to uh, encode. 
at the logical level. But we encode it with multiple, uh, multiple qubits uh, uh, in order to protect it against, uh, against losses uh, in a sort of redundant way, just as you do in, uh, in classical information theory. So we have, let's say, a larger number of physical systems And this is my encoding procedure. And the encoding uh, 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 used in that, uh, in that paper uh, uh, is known as toric code. Okay. Not going to explain it, but it's just uh, to give you an idea. Um, then, Once you have encoded, let's say, your single uh, qubit uh, in, uh, in a larger set of physical qubits, uh, those are going to uh, undergo a certain uh, noise process that is outside your control. And uh, therefore, uh, um, what you want to do is recover the original information, in particular the original information contained in your original uh, logical qubits. And uh, you do that uh, with a series of interventions. So first, you measure some, uh, uh, some of your qubits, let's say, uh, and uh, uh, this measurement is called the syndrome measurement. And uh, uh, the syndrome is telling you uh, something about your errors, but how exactly the outcome, so the syndrome measurements might be uh, measure uh, uh, the spin in a certain direction uh, for your qubit, uh, uh, for your first uh, physical qubit, uh, then in another direction for your third physical qubit, etc. So you will have uh, measurement outcomes of your experiments, uh, and this we can call S, okay, and associate uh, a term I to say simply that, okay, we're going to, uh, in principle, to have many, many of that. So these are going to be uh, my set uh, of, uh, of data. And then the idea uh, is that once uh, uh, you have measured your syndrome, you can associate to it a corresponding error that has occurred, or at least with certain probability, uh, in, in this noisy process. And when you associate to the syndrome the error, uh, then you can correct for this error, okay? So this is, let's say, the coding or error correction. Uh, and uh, therefore, here, you want to find a mapping that goes from the syndromes to the error. Okay? Uh, and this is a very similar problem to what, uh, uh, to, to the general framework uh, uh, that uh, we've been talking about uh, for uh, uh, supervised learning. Okay? So you might think uh, that you have a set of data that gives you your uh, syndrome and the associated error, so the associated label. And then you train your algorithm in order to find uh, the parameters that gives you the best function uh, that associate to possible new syndromes uh, the corresponding uh, errors. Okay? And you want to do that with the best accuracy uh, so that um, at the end of the day, uh, uh, you can tolerate uh, more noise, uh, as much noise as possible here. Okay. And uh, uh, here in this paper, they use a feedforward uh, neural networks. And uh, you can see that uh, uh, the input is in the form of, uh, of syndromes. So these are represented by these crosses uh, uh, and squares. And then we're, going, uh, we're seeing a nomenclature that I'm going to introduce later on, but just to give you an idea. Uh, mm, this is, a, uh, let's say, a way of uh, mm, 
representing uh, uh, neural networks in which you have a certain nodes here that are your inputs, then a set of fully connected layers uh, uh, with other, of other nodes that are given here. These are called hidden, uh, uh, hidden neurons. And then the output. Uh, the output are going to be uh, the errors that the algorithm suggests you based uh, on the syndrome at the input. But we will see this uh, in much more detail later. Uh, and uh, uh, the power of this, uh, of this method uh, can, be, um, can be understood from this plot. Because here you can see that uh, the, the fraction of corrected error for this uh, case when they use these neural networks uh, is larger than uh, the fraction of errors uh, uh, that can be corrected using the, the best uh, known algorithm uh, uh, for, for, for this type of codes that is the minimal weight uh, perfect matching algorithm, okay? uh, which uh, uh, turns out in the fact that you can tolerate a larger amount of noise uh, and uh, uh, by using uh, this error syndrome association found by the neural network with respect to the amount of noise that you can tolerate by using, uh, on the other hand, known, uh, known methods. Yeah. Questions? Uh, if not, maybe we can take a five minutes break and we can start, uh, yeah, uh, 10 past 10. But I've been told uh, that you shouldn't move too much uh, around. <laughs> we will have a proper break uh, at 11.